Good morning. Good to be with you all this morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Hannah De Pasquale. It's my joy and honor to be with you here at Peace Lutheran Church, where all people are welcome to full participation in the life of the church, regardless of race or ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, physical or mental disability, or any other identity that you carry with you today. You are welcome here. You are welcome to fully participate as you are and whoever you are. Um, that welcome at Peace Lutheran extends to our communion table. We are not gatekeepers. We just extend the welcome. And so if you don't worship very often or are part of a different church or think you're too young, you're not. Um, so please do join us at the Lord's Supper. A uh, special welcome to any visitors or anyone here for the first time. Um, would love to meet you after worship. If you would introduce yourself to me or to someone else, that would be wonderful. Um, I have a, and another welcome to anyone worshiping online. Um, we still have folks Zooming with us every week, and so we're glad that you're here as well. We have... Um, a training after worship today, a couple of trainings, but a few things have changed. <laughs> First of all, if you are willing or interested in helping with our altar care, um, that's our wonderful folks who set up um, for the Lord's Supper. Carol is here. She is giving, I asked her to give a wave. That's Carol. Um, <laughs> and if you would find her after worship, she will do a training with you. Um, it's a very important, and I've heard um, kind of an honoring and humbling job to be able to do that, so I hope that you'll consider helping us with that. We could use a few more folks. And then um, for ushers and greeters, our trainer is out today, out sick today, and then our other ushers who are kind of our experts are also out sick today. <laughs> um, but we have several folks who know how to do the job. Um, so if you were one looking forward to learning how to become an usher or you are a current usher, I would just ask you to maybe check in with Sandy, um, who will have some, she's in the back, <laughs> who will have some training sheets available, or you can come check in with me and I'll connect you with someone who can kind of show you the ropes. And if it's not today, we'll do it again soon. But it won't be a, a formal gathering. We'll kind of, it's going to be a bit casual. Um, but if you are interested in helping us with greeting or ushering, please do speak to me or Sandy, or you can talk to one of our wonderful ushers who are at the door today, um, and we will get you plugged in. Thank you for your willingness to help us out. Um, many hands make, make light work, and uh, it's good to get to do worship together and for everyone to be a part of it. Um, there go my announcements, so I'm going to invite Joel, our council treasurer, up here for our, the rest of our announcements. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, your announcements are listed on the green sheet here. You can read them at your leisure. However, <clears throat> remember that your contributions go to pay for Sandy, and Sandy spends a lot of time putting this together. <laughs> so get your money's worth. Read it over carefully. A um, couple of things here. We have the shoe tree that you should be uh, donating to out in the narthex. Also, I understand that a big thank you goes out to our uh, food pantry people. They gave away 100 turkeys on Thursday. That's a lot of turkey. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, the other thing is it looks like the Deemers have their annual holiday shopping open house. I got to go see that. I've never been there. I got to go see that. Um, like I said, be sure to read your announcements. And get your money's worth. Thank you. With that, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and prepare your hearts for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by a sin that divides your beloved community.
Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you and our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved children of God, through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God, our merciful Master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading is from the prophet Zephaniah in the first chapter. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps 
and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord, their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. The, in the fire of his passion, the whole earth will be consumed. For a full, a terrible end, he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. The word of the Lord. Be God. Please join me in reading responsibly Psalm 90. <clears throat> Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and the earth were born, from age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. All right. I don't see any kiddos. Are there any kids out there? <laughs> hey, Mateo. <laughs> um, well, I'll just do a little intro. Um, instead of using the example I had for the kids, because I had to think of something they would relate to, but not be too excited about. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you, you'll figure out why. <laughs> um, did any of you collect Beanie Babies? Some of my generation, oh, Joyce, yeah, Beanie Babies, okay, yeah. So um, did any of you <laughs> put the little tag protectors on your Beanie Babies? Because they might be worth something someday. <laughs> so this is the thing with Beanie Babies, right? It was a toy of my childhood and teenage years, and I would get one for $5. I don't know, they would release a at my local store maybe once a week or once a month. And, but some of them were going to be worth so much in the future that I couldn't play with them. Instead, I had to put a plastic tag, tag protector on their, their cardboard tags and put them on the shelf so that we could sell them someday because they're going to be worth thousands. <laughs> that day hasn't come yet. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I haven't been looking, uh, keeping track of it. Um, and there, I had this special, the special Princess Diana bear. Um, it was the purple bear with the, with the flower on it. And she sits in a plastic box on top of a shelf in my childhood bedroom to this day <laughs> because she's so valuable. And what do we do with these, these toys that we buy as a toy, but then we put on a shelf, right? Because it's too valuable. It's too risky to have the chance of their tag falling off or them getting dirty or them getting broken. But that's not really the point of a toy, is it? Right? It becomes a collectible item at that point. And so we're going to talk about, with the parable of the talents today, what it might mean to 
entrust, be entrusted with God's love and be willing not to just hide it away or put it on a shelf or bury it in the ground, but being willing to take some risks with it, even though it is super valuable, the most valuable gift that we've been given. So that's my message for today. <laughs> so I invite you to rise, embody our spirit, and we'll sing to receive the gospel. <laughs> According to Matthew, the 25th chapter. <clears throat> Jesus said to the disciples, For it is as a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the, the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master." And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent and also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance." But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, open our minds and our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may receive your word with joy. Amen. Another parable of judgment. How fun. <laughs> Let's get into it. <laughs> but before we do that, I'm going to give you a little more. Now you know I collected Beanie Babies, and I'll give you a little more about who I used to be. Um, if any of you read my biography that I think we published in the September newsletter, um, you would have read that my call to official ministry began when I reluctantly said yes to working at church camp when I was a college student. 
I, the first summer, where I wasn't even sure what I was doing there, soon became a second summer that I felt more like I should be there, which soon became a third summer, where I was actually recruited by another camp to be in charge of their adventure activities, including the camp's climbing tower and zipline. I've got a picture of the tower. So every afternoon, there it is, <laughs> in that summer, when choice time, that's not me, but, <laughs> um, but every afternoon when choice time would roll around and the campers got to decide what they would do, I would haul all the supplies and all the rope and all the helmets to the hollow 30-foot wooden tower. I would harness myself up and I would clip myself in and out of the ladder, I have a picture of the ladder, where I waited at the top for the middle school and high school students to arrive so that they could challenge themselves and climb the wall and then do the zip line. So the most challenging part of this for the campers um, was usually not getting to the top of the tower. It wasn't scaling the side of the wall. They usually did that pretty okay, depending which difficulty of the tower they were doing. But once you get to the top, this is your view. And when they got up there, and were on the platform with me, and I was clipping them into the zip line, that's often when the nerves started to set in, right? When the fear would set in, when they had to start thinking about how they were gonna get down from this tower, <laughs> and what it meant to trust a zip line. So when the kids got to the top, they were escorted by me to the small platform. I would clip them in, and then I would get them on the edge of the platform, make sure that they were all safe and hooked in, and then tell them to zip. It's not so simple, though, to just zip, <laughs> right? Got one more picture of someone waiting to zip. She's about to scooch off. <laughs> I don't know how many times, probably more than half, that the fear really kicked in for these kids. It's just me and them, 30 feet in the air, their only way to go is to scooch off of that platform. The hesitation, the shaking hands, grasping for something other than just the tether to their zip line. Here, 30 feet above the earth, they had to decide how and if they were gonna push through the fear and have this thrill. With this parable of judgment, we hear again some harsh words from Jesus. Remember, as I said last week, that when we read these parables, we read them in the whole context of the whole narrative. This is toward the end of our journey through Matthew, through with Jesus in this book, this gospel book. And these are some of Jesus's final teachings before he will approach his death. Another quick note that the talents discussed here were sums of money. They're probably pretty large sums of money, years worth of wages, so the 10 talents was an outrageous amount for, for a slave to be thinking about. And although Jesus is using harsh language, I'm not convinced that this text or the Zephaniah text are meant to threaten or to scare. Jesus is speaking with his disciples who will soon see their best friend die. Here, I think he's giving them a word of caution, maybe, but more encouragement. To offer encouragement as they are about to witness a tragedy and to remind them that even though they're going to be afraid, that fear doesn't have to be what takes over when they are on that platform. When you're hoisted 30 feet in the air with nowhere to go, when you're witnessing something horrible that you didn't expect, when you're in a scary situation, it makes sense to have fear, right? It makes sense that the fear creeps in. When you're asked to take care of a lot of money from a wealthy person who you've perceived as harsh and unfair, it makes sense that the fear creeps in. When you're living in a world full of war and violence and suffering, it makes sense that the fear creeps in. I was afraid, so I hid your talent in the ground, the slave says. Rather than take some risks and do the business, do business with the money like the other two, the third slave lets the fear drive his actions, and he takes no risk. And it doesn't go anywhere. I really like, I have a slide for this, how Father Capon, Capon 
frames this parable. I've been spending time with Robert Capon through these parables. He voices this from the master who could be called God. The master saying, I asked you to do a little business, to exercise a little pragmatic trust that I meant you well and that I wouldn't mind if you took some risks with my gift of a lifetime. Pragmatic trust is what stands out to me. We talk a lot about trusting God, don't we? Especially here at church. But what does it look like to actually live out that trust? What does it mean to be pragmatic with that trust? When a, a camper was struggling with the fear at the top of that platform, I knew I could encourage them to scooch off because we had the trust of their harness and a tested zip line that I knew they would be safe. They could take the risk because the big stuff that matters, the most important stuff to keep them safe, was taken care of. All they had to do was zip. The gift of a lifetime that we've been given is God's ceaseless love for us. A love that has spanned generations as the psalmist praises, Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. This extravagant, generations-long love, do we take it and bury it in the ground? Or do we embrace it and then let it multiply, sharing it with the rest of the world? What was the third slave the most afraid of? The master's wrath. He was afraid that he would be unjust. He thought he was wrathful and harsh. did you hear here at church is that we don't have a wrathful God, rather a God who we know that our faith is based on a God who gives us extravagant grace from a forgiving God who seeks reconciliation and redemption. But do we live out our faith this way? Do we live out our faith based on fear and limitations? Or do we lean into the abundance and the possibility and take risks when necessary. Taking a risk of faith, living out that pragmatic trust, doesn't always have to be a huge leap, although it can be. But once you get on that platform, all you have to do is scooch, and then you're zipping. Sometimes you don't have to jump, sometimes it's just a scooch or just a step. Sometimes it takes some coaxing or encouragement from the community around you, reminding you that you can trust, reminding you you can trust us and that God's got you too. Sometimes taking a risk of faith looks like that of our beloved Doc Quaintance, who died in October. Moving to Denver for a year to live with a group of folks half her age, and then bringing back a vision of transformation on the border. It's pretty amazing. Pastor Loy wrote about Dot. He said Dot Dot possessed a risky faith. She believed that things would go the way that God intended and didn't hesitate to take risks based on her confidence that God was leading her life. That confidence that trust, that God is leading our lives will empower us to take the risks when we are called to. It's going to look different for each one of us. It might not mean a move across the country, although for some of you it has, and for some of our beloved community it has. But it's going to look different, and it might be small, it might just be that one little scooch. And I think that's okay. The master in our parable wasn't obsessed with how much money the slaves made. He would have settled for the measly half a percent that the savings account would have made. (laughs) He was just upset that the slave didn't take any risks, right? I don't think Jesus' message for us is, hey, look how much money you can make, or look how good your life can be if you follow me. But it's what could life look like? What could the world look like if you trust me and take a risk? So what risk has God been calling you to take? Is there a conversation you've been feeling led to have? An invitation you've been meaning to make? The neighbor whose house you need to go stop over at? Or is it the extra cushion sitting in your bank account that you know you could give away this holiday season? 
Or is it the passion project that gives you joy, but you've been hesitant to start it because you don't know if it's going to be good enough? Or maybe there's advocacy or a cause that you really feel deeply about, but you haven't taken any action on. The risk can be all sorts of things. And what risks are God calling us to take as a congregation, as a community of faith who live into the trust, the pragmatic trust? We don't have to be careless with our risk-taking, but we do need to trust. We trust that God has taken care of the big stuff, so we get to respond knowing that God's got us, and we can take some risks and share God's love in some extravagant ways. We pray with the psalmist, teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to your wisdom. We want your wisdom inscribed upon our hearts, and as we heed the prophet's warning that we don't rest in complacency. Trusting God and taking risks does not look like complacency. We've got work to do, and it's not always going to be easy. Because living in faith, living in trust, is not easy. It's risky. Not because of some wrathful God waiting to punish us, but because of the difference we could actually make if we took the words of Jesus seriously and took some risks. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Creed, let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us turn our hearts to God, our breath and life, as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Gracious God, you give talents and to serve. Turn us from fear and self-serving ways that we use our talents to glorify you and encourage our neighbor. Hear us, O God. You have been our dwelling place from one generation to another. Sustain the life of the planet. Protect farmlands and harvests. Direct all people in wise stewardship of all the earth's resources. Hear us, O oh God. Jesus. You call us to honesty and integrity. Instill these values in the hearts of all nations and their leaders. Free any who are oppressed, expose all corruption and bring redemption to victims of injustice. Hear us, O God. You teach us to count our days, that we may gain heart. Where there is sickness and sorrow, bring healing. And where there is loneliness, reveal your love in community. We remember before you for healing, David, Ahmed, Jacqueline, Adam, Joel, Mark, and Rhonda, and for God, D, Joy, Skipper's grandson, and Erica. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for the faith formation ministries of our church. Give to all children, youth, and adults who study your word the breastplate of faith and love. Shape us by your love and show us how to encourage one another. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious God, you are faithful in all generations for the promise of life and rest and for the witness of those who have died in faith, especially the saints of the church, Clement, Bishop of Rome, Miguel Austin Pro, Martyr, Isaac Watts, hymn writer, Justice Faulkner, Yehu Jones, and William Passavant, pastors in North America, and the Saints of Peace, Tanya, Alta, Flora, Willie, Kathy, and Richard. We offer all our spoken prayers and those held in our hearts, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace with one another. Peace be with you. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. invite you to find your seats as we receive our offering from the choir and the gifts from you all.
Let us pray. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them, that as we gather these gifts from your abundance, and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church here on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread he gave thanks he broke it and gave it to the disciples to eat saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me again after supper he took the cup he gave thanks and he poured it out for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. invited to this table in whatever way is comfortable for you. So if you are coming forward, take a, uh, an empty cup from the trays and then come to the rail where you are invited to kneel or stand or remain seated or whatever is comfortable for you. We have both wine and grape juice available. Just let us know which one you would like. We also have gluten-free wafers available for those of you that need that. Um, if you'd like to come forward but not receive communion for whatever reason, you're welcome to fold your arms and I will give you a blessing. If you are more comfortable staying in your seats, um, just let us know and we are happy to bring communion to you. If you are communing at home or in your seats right now, I invite you to do that now. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. There is a place for you at this banquet, so please come to Christ's table. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
rise in body or spirit. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children and give us great and generous hearts as we meet you on the May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. And the blessing of God, sovereign, savior, and spirit, bless you now and always. Amen. of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.